a very late lunchtime talk. Our speaker today is um, Rob, who is South Africa's leading researcher on Devonian marginal marine and terrestrial eco ecosystems, and is based at the Albany Museum in Makanda. Um, he says his life was forever changed at the age of eight when he discovered a large, dance, oh my God, I can't even pronounce it, skull on a farm in the Karoo. From then on, the history of life and clues to it in the form of fossils and sediments became his enduring passion. He was fortunate to enjoy early mentoring from Dr. Norton Hiller at Rhodes University in his hometown, um, then called Grahamstown. Norton's passions for the Devonian rubbed off on him, so he was well equipped when roadworks in the mid 80s, south of Mkanda, revealed black fossil, fossiliferous shales where he could later really cut his teeth on systematic excavation under Norton's gardens. Although he's worked on a range of fossil sites, he has never managed to get away from this one. So I'm gonna hand over to you, please. And if you'd like to tell us about um, the origin of tetrapods, thanks so much. Okay, thank you very much, Nailene. Um, Yes, we're talking about the origin of tetrapods, but particularly our own sort of South African perspective thereon. The, if you look at today at, um, if you look at a sort of really simplified family tree like this of modern um, vertebrates, then you can see on the right hand side here we have things which have legs, amphibians, mammals, reptiles, and birds. And then on the left of it here, we have things that broadly speaking would be uh, referred to as fish, um, with lampreys on the far left, and hagfishes would also be there. There's a jawless fish. And then there's sharks, cartilaginous fish, as well as holocephalins, of course. Um, ray finned fish that really make up about 85% of modern fish. Um, Chondrichthyan sharks and their kin making up the other 15. And then there's six species left of lobe fin fishes today, two species of coelacanth and six of lungfish, uh, which is all that remains of, of, of once a very broad lineage. If you look at the simplified um, family tree here, you'll see that then there's some really important links that are missing, like dinosaurs that link reptiles and birds, or birds are dinosaurs could say, and they died out at the end of the Cretaceous. And then at the end of the Devonian, you saw the last um, armored jawless fishes and armor-plated jawed fishes, which uh, fill a huge amount of, uh, for the family tree between lampreys and sharks, despite what some zoological textbooks might lead one to think. And then between lobe from fish and uh, creatures with legs, there's a little group down there, a uh, stem group tetrapods that are shown there that also went extinct at the end of the Devonian 358 million years ago. So we're going to focus really on those stem group tetrapods now. Um, so there's three main exemplars we're looking at. We've got uh, coelacanth and lungfish there on the left. They're the surviving lobe from fishes. But there were a whole lot of other groups of lobe from fishes that I haven't shown here. But we're focusing on tristocoptrids, which are the last really fishy fish in this transition. Then there's a, a great elpistostegids, which are sort of tetrapod-like fish. And then you get basal tetrapods, and they are the ancestors, not only of ourselves, who are amniotes, but also of reptiles and amphibians. So we take a look a bit closer. We have here tristocoptrid fish, elpistostegids, and tetrapods. You're going to be hearing a lot about these. You can see tristocoptrid fish have the normal sort of complement of fins that you would expect to find in, 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 in lobe fin fishes, two dorsal fins. Lobe fin fish actually only have one. Um, an anal fin, a caudal fin, and two pairs of paired fins, the pectoral and pelvic fins. In the grade of elpistostegids, you've got the, uh, you've lost the dorsal fins. In most elpistostegids, you probably lost the anal fin, although elpistostegi itself has reasonably been found to retain as remnant anal fin. But you've got development, particularly of the pectoral and pelvic fins, which are the paired fins, and these are the ancestors, obviously, of our limbs. But you'll see in elpistostegids, they still end in, 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 in webbed fins. 
and then in stem tetrapods, like up top right, you only got the caudal fin, the tail fin left, and the uh, pad fins now end in toes. So that's really in a very simplistic sense what we're looking at. Uh, these are skeletons. Eustonopteron is classic. It's the best known Tristocoptrid skeletally. So it's classically used as an example of Tristocoptrids as the sort of proxy last fishy fish. Um, Tectalic, Elpistostegi, and Pandarechthus, and also Parapandarechthus, are the known Elpistostegids. And there again, you can see skeletal differences, quite large ribs, which might support um, uh, more air breathing, because um, they make the um, lung, the lung, chest region more rigid. Um, certainly by the time you get to, to Acanthostega down the bottom here, the tetrapod, you've also lost all the uh, bones that cover the gill region, the opercula series, and those also appear to be missing in Tiktaalik, although they're not missing in Pandarechthus. Another difference you'll immediately see between the tetrapod and the, the Eustonopteron there is you can see the pelvic girdle, the one that the back legs is attached to, it extends up further and is braced against the spinal cord, the spinal column. Um, and it's also actually linked underneath whilst in fish that just sort of floats there. And equally well, you've got this big blade on the shoulder girdle of Tiktaalik and Acanthostega that also goes right up to the um, vertebral column to really brace those limbs. And the front limbs were probably as shown in that reconstruction of Tiktaalik, uh, somewhat weight-bearing. These creatures were probably fully aquatic, but they used their legs to lift themselves and to move. But the first really well-known um, uh, tetrapod, there are only two really well-known tetrapods, um, but before the Cantostig was was found with skeletal material, um, Ichthyostega was known, also from the Celsiusberg in, in uh, Greenland, and it was discovered in the 1930s and more material in the 1940s by Swedish and Danish expeditions. And it was originally reconstructed sort of like this, uh, as a terrestrial animal, clearly this thing had toes and it was a tetrapod, so it was assumed this thing was the earliest land animal. However, there's a lot of reason to think it wasn't. And this is a more re re recent reconstruction. Um, because the knees and the wrists don't flex, if we go back to that in this manner, um, it couldn't stand like a modern reptile at all. And in fact, the back leg, which is the only one that's well preserved, is probably was more used more like a flipper um, and has a backward pointing this like that. And then the, you can see also what I've shown there is that although it was originally shown as having five toes, its front limb isn't complete, uh, combination of the part and counterpart subsequently have shown that this thing in fact had seven toes, although it's possible that those three small ones functioned as a single unit. In fact, all stem tetrapods, that's pre uh, before the end of the Devonian, all had more than five toes, which is quite interesting. So now this is Jenny Clack when she was visiting South Africa decades later. But in 1987, Jenny Clack and various people from Cambridge, they were quite intrigued to find more of a second tetrapod, also known from Greenland, called Acanthostega earlier. And Acanthostega, there was this intriguing um, stratigraphic log of, of the Celsiusberg um, by a geologist in 1970. And he had brought back some bits of skull from the Canthostega. And on his log, there was a, a layer which was annotated abundant tetrapod remains, which seeing as tetrapods from that age were hardly known, it seemed really too good not to go and have another look at that. So they went off there. And um, they actually found this bed, the exact bed the geologist had mentioned in his strat log. And it was full of uh, tetra of acanthostegas, um, and as you can see from this picture, many of them had fairly complete uh, skeletons. And the Cambridge group then worked on that, and Mike Coates 
uh, was the first person to put together a thorough reconstruction of how the Cantostega would have looked. Now, if we compare Cantostega with Ichthyostega, um, one can see that it's, uh, although it's in many ways a similar creature, in many of the details, it's, 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 it's very different. Strikingly, it has this far bigger tail still, and it's got shorter ribs. It's more sort of uh, flexible altogether, and clearly this thing would have been more definitely aquatic. So the main view is that this would be a, for want of a better word, a more primitive tetrapod, lower down on, 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 on the lineage that led to terrestrialization, and that Ichthyostega might have been able to sort of lumber onto shore, but like a seal. Um, however, there is, of course, a, an alternate view that based on various other characters of Acanthostega, that it was maybe somewhat higher on that lineage than the Ichthyostega, but had secondarily become more aquatic again, although that's extremely controversial and debated. The problem, obviously, is when you've only got two skeletons of an entire important lineage, well, we know with other high-profile lineages in this country, um, you can have a lot of debaters to exactly what their relationships are. Nonetheless, we do have two early tetrapod skeletons, and they provide a real Rosetta stone for understanding uh, what bones are really characteristic of tetrapods. And that has allowed for a plethora of other genera to be described, the exception of one other um, skull from the on Greenland also, um, this is the sum total of what of known genera prior to 2018 of tetrapods. So you can see they're not very common at all. And in many ways, yeah, these are very rare considering how important they are. And you may well wonder, well, how can you say that that little bit of shoulder girdle there or that bit of jaw there is a tetrapod. And the reason is that across this transition from fish to tetrapods, there are a lot of important changes. If we just look at a few quickly. Um, in this uh, series here, you can see the skulls um, of a Tristocoptera, used to not drawn actually, an Elpistostegid, and a tetrapod. And you can see that in the in, in, in the Tristocoptrid fish, the eyes are very far forward and the snout's made up of a whole lot of little bones. And then you've got really in green there is the um, parietal and then yellow the postparietal. They are quite long, so the back of the, the piece of the skull behind the eyes is very long. And even behind that, there are more bones, extra scapulars. By the time you're looking at that Alpistostega, you have in purple there an extra set of bones, the frontals, and the eyes are being progressively, uh, are progressively moving back. And in the tetrapod, the nasals have actually been reduced to just two big nasals. There are far fewer little bones in the front of the skull. The eyes are far back, further back. And both the per parietal and postparietal are a lot shorter. So the eyes are quite far back and it's got this big sort of bonnet-like snout in the front and these big eyes quite high up on the head. So the skull roof is entirely changed. So if you get a skull roof, you know what's happening. And then you notice those two little notches on either side of the parietal. Uh, those are the spiracular notches. It had two little breathing holes there. And in the Elpistostega, you can too see two slits leading in there, which would have also uh, been open to the spiracles. Below that, I've got in profile there the cheeks of these things. And this is also quite just another example of what's interesting here. The, there are two bones that have made one dark blue and one light blue. The dark blue one's the lacrinal, and the light blue one's the jugal. And look at the position of the eye there as it moves back in, in the tristocoptrid fish. The bottom of the eye is entirely enclosed in the lacrinal. In the Elpistostegid, both the lacrinal and the jugal make up part of the bottom of the eye socket. Whilst in the pet tetrapod, only the jugal does. So again, you can tell the grade of a fossil uh, of a jugal by the 
it's of to what extent it does or doesn't um, constitute part of the eye socket. And then the jaw, um, the infragnathals um, in the tetrapod lower jaw there are arranged also in a very distinctive way. So lower jaws are also very telling, rich, and then obviously the other thing that's really most prominent is the transformation of the shoulder girdle. This, this is the real difference, um, or one of the main differences, because the tristocoptered fish, it only has to move that fin up and down. So you'll see there the green bone is the scapular coracoid. Well, let's jump first to the tetrapod shoulder girdle there on the far right. There the main bone is the green bone, the scapular coracoid, and that is our shoulder bone, essentially. Um, the blue bone in the front there, long thin one wrapping around the front, that's the clavicle, which is our collarbone. And then the red bone there is a bone that we no longer have, the um, clythrin. And you still get that in some amphibians, but it's, um, it essentially has been usurped in our shoulder by the shoulder blade. That's the bit that goes up and braces the shoulder girdle against the backbone so that you can do press-ups essentially without your shoulder wobbling off. Now in the fish, it's different. We go back to that tristocoptered fish. You've got a huge clithrum. It's the main item and it's covered in dermal ornament. In front of it is a big triangular clavicle and the scapular coracoid is just a tiny little bone which is stuck onto the inside of the clithrum and has no connection to the clavicle at all. The elpistostegid um, is a bit different. The clavicle is now beginning to come down. Clithrum is a bit reduced and the green bone, the scapular coracoid is more exposed, which allows muscles to be attached to in front of the socket allowing that limb to be moved forwards and not just up and down. It can move sideways forwards. And the socket itself is partially outwardly projected. Again, in the tetrapod. And you'll see there also most of it is covered in uh, dermal ornament. In the tetrapod, there's no dermal ornament in the clithrum. It's got that little, the clithrum's now sitting right on top there, just having that blade function. It's got a little spike Going down, note that between the clavicle and the scapular coracoid, it's attached to both of them there, and the classroom is also attached straight to the scapular coracoid. And also notice the top of it, whilst the top in the just copperhead fish is kind of 90 degrees at square, this is inclined, and it's got a little bump at the bottom going onto that ridge on the scapular coracoid, which braces it there so that it doesn't get snapped off under strain, essentially. So all of these features, these are just a few features that allow us to identify these creatures either on the jaw or on little bits of the skull or on the shoulder girdle because they are very, very distinctive. So what does having all these genera based on fragments really tell us about tetrapods? Well, it seemed that what they told us was that you could plot them all on a biogeographical map like this and um, they all mainly from Laurasia, which is the northern continent. In fact, all Elpistostegids also came from Laurasia and all tropical. And the only two that didn't come from Laurasia was a little bit of jaw from China, which was a separate little piece of land near Gondwana, and one jaw, uh, Metaxignathus, that came from Eastern Australia there, which was also in the tropics. So that seemed to have a pattern that could be useful for understanding tetrapods. So for example, here in uh, Scientific American in 2005, uh, Jenny Clack points out that all of these things, uh, the three tetrapods, the Elpisocegas and the tetrapods all seem to, with two exceptions, come from Laurasia. They're all tropical and then they're just these two ones that seem to have wandered off to the Chinese block and to New South Wales and Australia but still in the tropics. So if you read it at the top, it says, it's now apparent that these animals live throughout the tropics and subtropics of the ancient landmasses Laurasia and Gondwana. 
and the earliest tetrapods it seemed inhabited freshwater and brackish water environments rather than strictly marine ones. So that was the takeaway story from all those bits and pieces, which is also then published in Gaining Ground, which is the, the textbook. This is a book everyone should actually have on their bookshelf. Back, who actually unfortunately passed away this year. So why was Jenny then in South Africa in 2008? Well, it was before publication of the second edition of that book, and she just wanted to just check because in South Africa, we have a nice site outside Makanda, which is a coastal marine site. And it's definitely very much not in the tropics. So the blue stars here, they show where Metaxignathus, the Australian tetrapod jaw, came from. And the other one shows some apparent tetrapod trackways in Australia. But that black star there is uh, the Waterloo Farm site um, near Makanda. And the P there is the approximate position of the South Pole, according to Torswick and Cox. According to Skatizi, the South Pole is actually closer to South America, but it doesn't make any difference really to the um, latitudinal position of Waterloo Farm. So here we have a, a really high latitude site down the coast from Australia there. So were there any tetrapods there? Well, actually, during Jenny's visit, she didn't really find any remains of tetrapods. But if we think about the site quickly, let's have a thought about it. What was it like at high latitudes at that point in time? Well, it was about the same distance from the South Pole as the Antarctic Peninsula now. So did it sort of look like this? This is a nice summer day. Um, but we don't believe it did look like this. In fact, we have evidence it didn't. Um, the Devonian was a bit warmer, and obviously the geographical conditions were different, and there was probably warm currents circulating in the Paleo-Pacific. So we have reason to believe that it would have been more like this, with uh, moist air uh, depositing snow and ice on the interior, maybe glaciers coming down from the interior, but a vegetated coastal belt with trees. And we know they were trees because we have fossils of two different species of these uh, progymnosperms, um, conifers, and we also have trunks, um, which aren't obvious yet, but it's a proof that these actually grew into trees. And there were a whole range of other plants, many of which we haven't described, but including a piece of Pods, right down to um, smaller lycopods and these tiny little herbaceous uh, scale little horsetail like plants. So a really nice thick vegetation from trees down to herbs and we also know that uh, it was inhabited vertebrates because we have these rather nice this pincer and sting from a scorpion which incidentally are the A nice special site. Um, it was described in, it was dis uh, discovered in this road cutting in 1985. And up at the top left where the two people are, I think you can maybe see my arrow. Uh, maybe not. But my arrow up here, there's a little lens of black shale there and um, of the uh, scratching around in this shale lens. Virtually all the light, all the fossils from Waterloo Park come from this shale lens. And the sandstones beneath this shale lens, which is in the Wittpurk formation um, of the Witteberg group, they all have been interpreted by Hiller and Taylor as, as barrier bar type sediments. Um, and above it, there's uh, shore face sediments. And that led them to interpret um, the, it as a back barrier lagoon. So in this slightly photoshopped version of the Kierbrom's estuary at Plett, you can see barrier bar sediments there, separating the shore face and the sea from a back barrier lagoonal environment over there. Muds, in this case, it was probably trying to get a lake in that position, and we got really nice anaerobic muds. This interpretation of a brack environment at the interface between um, 
marine and non-marine conditions is supported by the coexistence of beautiful seaweeds with brackish water carophytes, of which that four species described. So these were coexisting, we find them on the same slabs, but obviously in different portions of the system. And then they're also fresh to brackish water bivalves, of which there are hundreds of specimens. The vertebrate fauna is also quite interesting and shows quite a lot of evidence for um, the use of the estuary for uh, estuary system as you get in a lot of estuaries today. So we have a juvenile to young adult lampreys, but we don't have bigger than young adult lampreys. And there's only out of our whole series of lampreys, there's only one that's a young adult and the rest are all juveniles. So this would probably be a marine taxa. It's the oldest fossil lamprey in the world. And you can actually see this exquisite preservation. Lampreys are very old, rare in the fossil record because they don't have a bone in their bodies and they're all cartilaginous and soft tissues. So this anaerobic preservation is, well, this is uh, the best preservation from any Fermenian site in the world. Anyway, other things that we're using it as a, a nursery are the coelacanths. Most of the specimens are in the sort of three and a half to five and a half centimeter range. Um, and then there are a few approaching adulthood known from isolated bones, and the, but no real adult. These again were probably marine taxa coming into the system to breed. Likewise, um, raven fish, which were quite sort of a minor component of Devonian ecosystems, mainly known just from little juveniles, and then a few uh, bones like that upper jaw at the bottom left there from larger specimens. So probably also a marine taxa, which either obligatorily or opportunistically was using the estuary as, as a nursery area. Although maybe sometimes the adults were also just coming in to, to, to feed a bit, the bigger ones. Likewise, there's several kinds of sharks, um, including this kind of shark here. That's a fin spine on the left, um, which was on the front. And in the middle there, again, you see this exceptional preservation. Those are the jaws, which are just cartilage. And that have these sort of um, Viking helmet-like teeth. Uh, and we know from isolated teeth that some of the sharks coming to the estuary were several meters long. So these would have probably been marine predators coming into the river mouths to feed, much as someone like Neisner or a lot of these um, estuaries along our coast, even ones that are seasonally closed, when they're seasonally open, sharks come in to feed. However, this little specimen, which is almost certainly the same species, is only 2.8 centimeters long. Um, it's a tiny baby. So also as some sharks do, apart from coming into forage, they may also have been using the estuary as a sort of nursery habitat. Then there are a lot of creatures that were um, permanent uh, inhabitants of the system because we know them from tiny ones up to big ones. This is the Antiochus which we've got isolated bones of individuals who would have been a meter long. On the left there, that's just the bony, but placoderms are an interesting group. They're part of this group that went extinct at the end of the Devonian. Um, that are, well, placoderms are the earliest jawed vertebrates. So Again, here yeah, you have early jawed vertebrates were bony. That's a good takeaway. Um, Antioch placoderms, instead of having front fins, they're very specialized. They have these armor plated, jointed, sort of uh, paddle like things in the front. And the head and the trunk armor kind of articulated on ball and socket joints, a pair of them. And then behind that, you had a long, fleshy tail as in the little juvenile on the right-hand side in this picture. You can faintly see the tail coming down behind the armor. And yeah, it's only one of two sites in the world where we have soft tissue of boss relief is preserved. The other main big group of uh, placoderms, which also had jointed head and trunk armors and then tail sticking out the back were arthrodite placoderms. This is Grimland aspis 
which as the name would suggest to you, is uh, the original species was also described from Greenland. And on the far left, you have a, a whole head and trunk armor of a really tiny one. And then in the middle, you can see pocket knife scale. You've got a whole lot of isolated bones from the trunk of a bigger one that's fallen apart. And again, these things, we have records of ones indicating individuals with a total body length of 25 millimeters up to over a meter. So they were probably permanent residents in the estuary. And you've got some quite interesting ones. This is another relative of these Arthrodia placoderms, which is this big spike on its back, which presumably was defensive. And to cut a long story short, because I'm not going to give you a full catalog of all the beautiful fishes we've got, but um, we also get these uh, Acanthodians, spiny fin fish. They're also cartilaginous fish. They're actually um, on the, they're the group from which sharks rose. Acanthodians. This one you can also see, it's got really, it's got a bony spike in front of every single fin. Again, this was obviously defensive, so, but they didn't only have sharks to worry about because there were also a number of different uh, big lobe and fishes, rhizodonts and tristocoptrids that seemingly were hunting there. And this again is interesting that we get bones of adult tristocoptrids, this is Hynearia, and but we don't have juveniles. So Hynearia is also only known from one other place in the world, but most of these more advanced tristocoptrids were living in freshwater ecosystems and so it's quite likely that they were coming in more freshwater times into the system to also to hunt and forage. And we've got some bones that would suggest that this area at Waterloo Farm got up to four meters long. So these are really big lobe from fishes. Now, those are obviously tristocoptrids, those are the fishes I was telling you the group that uh, represent the most fishy close relatives of tetrapods. So anyway, when Jenny came in 2008, I think it was, uh, we had a look through the material and she didn't recognize any tetrapod material. And in the whole fossil site was actually demolished in, well, firstly in 2009, but then totally demolished in 2008. And however, Sanrail kindly uh, negotiated with Sanrail on both occasions. And they facilitated the mining by myself and a team of people by hand, because this is really crumbly stuff, of a lot of that shale lens, big enough sample to keep me busy for a very, very long time. And they built these nice sheds. So hats off to Sanrail on that. And I've been continually going through there. Oh, some of the specimens I showed you earlier, I've also found since then. But, um, that's me. I have a little picnic table and a knife and a little hammer and I just carefully go through the shale because the stuff is precious. Although I've got those whole sheds, there is a limited amount of it and it is the most incredible stuff. So anyway, one day I was uh, splitting shale at my table there with Chris Harris, who's a student of mine, um, and I found this little bone on the right and I was, uh, well, I immediately realized that this was something awesome because if you look at it, it's got an inclined top to it. If this is a clytum of a fish or not a fish, it has no dermal ornament on it. It's got an inclined top. At the bottom there, it's slightly broken off, but there's a sort of spike going down. You can see a sort of uh, attachment area in front here for a downwardly directed um, clavicle. And a big attachment area here for a big scapular coracoid. And there's that little buttress um, for bracing it against the scapular coracoid so it wouldn't shear off um, weight bearing. So you can see, there we go, inclined top, spike coming down, overlap area for the clavicle, big overlap area for the scapular coracoid, and that little bump. So that is definitely from a tetrapod. And um, it would then, well, First thing I did, obviously, was to uh, contact Mike Coates, who was my former PhD supervisor, and had done all that early work on Acanthostega, and he was, yeah, not pretty much certain of that. 
So it would fit quite comfortably with these other clythra of tetrapods up here. Um, so that was really exciting. This changes a lot about what we understand about the biogeography of the tetrapods. Varies up until this point about the conditions under which tetrapods developed, tropical lakes and lagoons. So I contacted uh, Per Alberg, who I know from early vertebrates meetings, and who is the current um, most researcher in early tetrapods. That's us looking at a tristopod some years before. And he arranged to come over. Um, however, whilst I was waiting for him to come over, I was thinking he's coming all the way from Sweden to here, and we're going to work on one bone, which is important that we do a good job on this bone, but he will have time to do something else. So I thought, oh, well, I've never described that Hynearia, that big Tristocoptrid, that one. So I'll start pulling out bones from that. And I have a lot of bones from a single layer, very much a single horizon, which all came from one individual that I managed to extract during roadworks in 1999, like square meters of rock covered in fish scales and bones and bits and pieces. And whilst I was laying those out for Per's visit, I came across this little bone here. Now this bone's really exciting. It's also a clithrum. We compare it to the other one. It also has this spike coming down here. The bottom half of it, the bit that tells us that it had, oops, that it had legs, etc., is almost identical. So from there down, you can see. It's got a spike there, it's got an overlap area for the attachment of the big clavicle going down. At the back, it's got a big overlap area for a big scapular coracoid. It also has this distinctive little buttress at the back. What is, however, a bit weird about it is that from there up, it's covered, you can see, in dermal ornament, which is quite surprising because no other tetrapods up until that time were known to have retained dermal ornament on the clithrum. So, however, then shortly after that, Per came, and whilst he was looking at something else, I went through all the slabs from that same horizon, um, looking amongst all the little fish scales, because these bones are tiny compared to the fish scales, looking for things with that similar ornament, and I came up with a whole handful of bones that almost certainly come from exactly the same individual. And these are quite uh, distinctive, uh, H and I. You can't see them so well, but they're fragments of jaw. Uh, F there is a, a, a very distinctively tetrapod frontal bone with that sort of uh, interdigited edges, which is very distinctive of tetrapod bones. And then in C and D here, you can see a, a, a jugal bone. Now, this is quite important. We know this is a jugal bone. Uh, this flat area at the bottom is the overlap area for the maxilla, the upper jawbone. Uh, the overlap area for the lacrinal, how it interjudicated is there. And importantly, the jugal canal, with quite distinctive shape, comes in here and along there. So this is definitely the jugal bone. And that little round bit at the top there, you can see it on part and on counterpart, that strengthened round area with no overlap area, that is the bottom of the eye socket. So all of these bones confirmed that this, in fact, that that second clithrum definitely also comes from a tetrapod. Um, so then we had the remains of two tetrapods. And the second tetrapod would actually come in a family tree of tetrapods the dark green, incidentally, on Eusthenopteron and Tiktaalik show the extent of the dermal ornament. And then you can see the dermal ornament marked in dark green on this new item there. So this indicates that this tetrapod is actually the most basally derived tetrapod known in the world so far. That's really exciting. And these obviously come from the polar region, so that upended the whole tropical coastal lagoonal theory, and we published this in science. Not only do we have one tetrapod, but we actually have a tetrapod fauna 
of two tetrapods that aren't closely related either. So this isn't a stray tetrapod that just made its way there. They were actually um, presumably niche partition, but certainly diversity of tetrapods. And although these bones look a bit skimpy, if you think back to that picture I showed you of all the tetrapod bones known in the world, a Mzantia, a Mazana there, the top one, is actually got quite a reasonable selection of its bones known compared to a lot of the other genera of tetrapods. And the other one I called Tutusius of Mlambo in honor of Desmond Tutu, who gave his permission. He was quite delighted. Mlambo obviously means river. So what then did this mean? Why this apparent distribution of tetrapods in the tropics? Well, just by comparison, if I take all the vertebrate, famous vertebrate sites from the latest Devonian, um, and I plot them on the same map, we see that those, are, those red dots are sites of other vertebrates, so fishes, essentially. And it means that once we, that wherever you have abundant sites with good fishes, if they are from more coastal, coastal lakes, you get tetrapods in the latest Devonian. So what this map here that we're looking at really illustrates is the relative abundance and distribution of early vertebrate paleontologists in the region, where most of them are centered on Europe and North America, a few in China and Australia, and one in Africa. So this really illustrates how collection bias can lead to whole environmental evolutionary scenarios uh, when, as they classically say, presence, absence, of, absence of presence isn't necessarily evidence for presence of absence. If we haven't looked, we haven't found, so we can't say that they never were there. Now, the other thing, obviously, is that Waterloo Farm is the, as I gave you a brief introduction to it, it is actually the best known from an ecological point of view, it's a bearing site in the world. It's actually got the best preservation of, in, in some senses, although the bones are all flattened, but of soft tissue of any communal site in the world. So other people have the advantage of their bones all nice and three-dimensional. We have the advantage that we preserve a lot of soft tissue and small, soft, delicate plants and seaweeds and organisms that you won't find in most other sites. And uh, the reason I uh, pointed out some of the ecological relationships is that clearly this kind of estuarine environment, which um, a lot of the other sites probably were estuaries as well, the component that these were fish nurseries is something I have argued as a possible, what the adaptation of first Elpisistegids and later tetrapods was, why we find them in estuarine environments, is I believe, and I have published this thought, that they were probably hunting juvenile fish. So you get these fish nurseries with shallow water, lots of little fishes moving amongst the water weeds, and these tetrapods they can move in shallow water, they can breathe through these sparkles in the back of their heads, so they can lie there like alligators. Um, they've got these back legs that are more flipper-like in function, they can give a sudden burst. The front legs can kind of push them up a bit, and it even occurred to me, if you chase, if you're snorkeling, or if you're a big fish and you chase shoals of juvenile fish in shallow water in estuaries, Sometimes they actually, little ones jump out onto the bank and they flounder around there and then they flip back in. So it's even possible that tetrapods would have had an advantage over other fish, that they could actually um, kind of heave their head and shoulders out of the water and grab the fishes that are complacently hiding on the shallow, muddy bank. But also mean that uh, the fact that they could really move around in shallow water would have given them an advantage against big predators like just copters and sharks that come into these environments. So anyway, I uh, hope you found that interesting. Um, that's just a brief introduction to our part of the tetrapod
Thank you so much. Right. Are there any questions from anybody? No? You're welcome to raise your hands or just jump right in. Uh, you can type the questions into the chat if you like. Hi, Rob. It's uh, Chris Hatton. Sorry, I'm, I only managed to join a bit late. Oh, hi, Chris. How are you? Good, thanks. Thanks, Rob, for a fantastic talk. Um, so so the, the sort of localities of tetrapods you said is uh, largely a function of collection bias. Yes, I think in a global sense, yeah. But um, the Europeans and North Americans have had an interest in these features for a long time, and so it's not that surprising that most of the specimens found have been there. The Chinese and Australians have been onto early vertebrates a bit later than others, so they've each got a piece of broken jaw. And then, well, I've been excavating early vertebrate, Devonian vertebrates quite a lot. And so it's not surprising that now I'm the first person who's been doing that, and now I'm finding tetrapod remains. I mean, it must be said that within these ecosystems, tetrapods were not common. Um, so the majority of the remains you would find in these kind of ecosystems would be fish remains. But then you do find tetrapod remains. So it is the tropical hypothesis of the origin of tetrapods is entirely collection bias. Yeah. And is there any place that they are more likely to have arisen than, than another? Just an open question. Well, we don't know. I mean, this is a very debated question. Um, we don't yet have Alpistostegids in this country in, in high latitudes, but again, we haven't really done the same rigorous collection, and maybe we don't have as many good sites, but I, I do believe we could find good sites in this country if we were really doing enough field work. So they could have arrived. I'm not saying that they didn't arise in the Russia. But what we're finding here, we have the most basally diverged tetrapod is one of our two tetrapods um, right down here. So tetrapods could just as well, I believe, have arisen in Gondwana. And they could have just as well arisen at highish latitudes in Gondwana. Um, we just have a far less complete fossil record. Okay. Thank, thanks, Rob. The, sure. the most basal petropods are in Gondwana. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's right. Thank so, you. So, so you can kind of see, Chris, um, yeah, that sort of uh, the Europeans and North Americans kind of pictured tetrapods evolving in Europe and colonizing the world. <laughs> it's a familiar story. <laughs> Familiar story, you, you can see the underlying sort of psychological predisposition to believe. <laughs> Thanks. I think at this point, Craig will ask a question. Okay, sure. Craig, Craig will not ask a question at this point. <laughs> Are there any I, other I guess I guess maybe I will. I mean, these these things went extinct. Um, when when was the timeline? Um, they they well until recently we believe they went extinct at uh, the end of onion extinction event three fifty eight. Um, although okay. some have been found in the earliest Carboniferous that are probably also basal tetrapods. So some of them maybe just kind of petered out shortly thereafter. But the end of onion extinction event pretty much paid to them, as it did to a lot of other things. I mean, it was really set the clock of modern uh, diversity. All those placoderms went. Um, by then, one saw the last of the armor plated uh, jawless fish, although they may have died out a little bit earlier. Most of the lobefin fish went. And um, rayfin fish, which were really a minor component of Devonian ecosystems, are now 85% of, of, of fish. and. So raven fish and sharks and tetrapods are now the dominant vertebrates, but none of those were dominant before the end of onion extinction events. It's kind of interesting. Is, 
Is there any consensus on the cause of that extinction event? Um, there isn't a complete consensus. No, all sorts of things have been suggested. Um, uh, there seems to have been a lot of climatic instability. And one really interesting theory was put forward by Al Jao and colleagues that that extinction event may well have been, according to them, related to the rise of the first forests. Because obviously trees are made up of uh, organic carbon. And so, well, we know with the greenhouse effect, if you put a lot of CO2 and carbon into the atmosphere, things warm up. But uh, things seem to have cooled off a bit at the end of the Devonian substantially. And there's a lot of anoxia in, um, at the time in water bodies. So it may actually have been a knock-on effect of the fact that you got really trees developing for the first time towards the end of the Devonian that may well have entirely changed atmospheric composition, leading to differences in uh, water composition, uh, global cooling, and obviously a lot of wash off of carbon into systems which weren't yet adapted to recycling carbon. So this biotic crisis towards the end of the Devonian may certainly in part have been the result of just an internal factor, the evolution of forests. It's quite sort of thought provoking. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks Rob. Are there any other questions for Rob? Uh, where, where do the coelacanths fit in? Coelacanths, um, well as I was saying, there's actually a coelacanths are actually one of the most basal divergences of lobe from fish. So coelacanths aren't really ancestral to tetrapods. Any other questions or comments? Right, I'd like to thank Tacoma Strategies who have sponsored the talks for September. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. Um, and our speaker, Rob, thank you so much. That was fascinating. If we have no more comments, Craig, I think you can close the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>